Okay. So one part of software engineering is writing code. It's sitting down at a computer, writing out a set of instructions on a program that does something. Maybe that program is responsible for helping someone do taxes, or maybe it's like a video player, maybe it's a game, whatever. But that's only one part of computer science. Computer science is a three part study. So when somebody studies computer science, it's as if they are studying another philo it's a, like as if they're studying another discipline like philosophy or you know biology there are it's multifaceted right so in the case of computer science you have three components which include software design so how do you write code mathematics so how does the math behind code work and ethics i say three prongs not two prong it's not just software design and math. We also need to include ethics. Now, this is a really important thing to define, and I want to lead with this definition of computer science, because when you guys hear news today, right? Controversial news, news that makes people upset. So can somebody tell me, what does that news tend to be about? Like, like what are some news that you've heard lately that's kind of upsetting? Racial issues. Racial issues. Okay. What else? The war in Ukraine. The war in Ukraine. Okay. Anything else? COVID. COVID. Yeah. Trump. What's that? Trump. Trump. Yeah. Okay. So the thing is, in each of these four sectors, technology plays a key role. Somehow, with the distribution of information or the collection of information. And sometimes we hear controversial news not just from an area that involves technology, but just from technology itself. Like we hear Facebook is doing so-and-so and it's extremely morally, uh, what, how, how shall we say, morally dubious, right? Facebook is doing something that is kind of sketchy, right? Or Apple or Google or whatever. Amazon is a big one, right? Amazon is doing so-and-so that's kind of sketchy. So we have, I would say, as I would posit, I've studied both computer science and history, so I have a degree in both from undergrad. I would say that within the realm of software engineering, we have learned to make a lot of money and to make products that serve a lot of people very fast, but we have lost our way in terms of ethics. So that's what today is going to be about. I'm going to be introducing you to, you guys, uh, to a few concepts in ethics. So, uh, yeah. I have a question. In terms of the ethics for those uh, disciplines like YouTube, they don't, who, control, who controls what they put in? Great question. So that's the issue. I mean, how do we know what's for real? How do we know it's for real? Uh, we don't. We don't. It gets harder and harder with each passing year. And I, so let me ask you this. When you say, how do we know what's real? So what do you mean by that? Like. How do I know what I'm, what they're telling me is actually true? Is it fact-based? Yeah, so that's the thing. In recent years, I would say for the past maybe six, seven years, I'm sure you guys have noticed this about American culture, but we're effectively fighting like an information. You have recently, I don't think this was really the case in 2012 or 2013 or 2014, but recently people have been questioning what truth is. What does it mean if something is scientific? What does it mean if something is adopted as consensus? These things are a lot more ambiguous than we are comfortable with. And that's what leads you to things like, you know, <clears throat> not to get too political, but fake you know, news. fake news, the concept fake of fake news. news, and then the questioning of everything. You have anti-maskers, anti-vax, anti-whatever, like, or people who think that the earth is flat. Like you have all sorts of crazy stuff coming out nowadays. Because people, maybe from like a philosophical standpoint, are questioning what truth is. The technology isn't just playing a role in that. Technology arguably is the reason why people do that. Because the internet is a pile of, of information, right? It's a pile of information. You can find anything, how to bake a cake, how to drive to LA, whatever. But it's also like anybody can say anything, which is good and bad. So. Uh, today we're going to be talking about ethics. Uh, first, we're going, to, we're going to be talking about two different areas of computer science. 
So the first part we're going to be talking about is data collection. So ethics in data collection, how companies get a whole bunch of data. So I'm going to give you guys a few examples and there is not a really a right or wrong answer. And I mean, I'm going to do my best to present uh, an impartial <clears throat> approach to these kinds of dilemmas. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm going to try to be impartial here. I'm going to try to not like have my own biases, but you'll hear me. If you listen close to what I'm saying, it'll be clear I have an opinion on that. But I want to be very clear. Um, I'm going to be showing you a few examples and I want you guys to draw your own conclusions from them. I want you to wonder if I were in charge of, uh, thank you, uh, if I were in charge of like a team responsible for creating this software, what decisions would I make based on my own ethical standpoint? So let's start with a prime example. Can somebody tell me what this is? One of those loud speakers. Speaker? It is a speaker, but it's not just a speaker. It's one of those intrusive. Oh, yes. What is it? Siri. Not Siri. Alexa. Alexa. There you go. So why do you say intrusive? Because it, it, it is sensitive to what's going on around it. Yes, it's very sensitive to what's going on around it. So point, it's not specific? No, it's not specific. Yes. Yeah. It's an Amazon Alexa. Amazon what? Alexa. The name of this. Alexa. Yes, Alexa. So what this is, is it's basically a little speaker, right? But it's not just a speaker. It's essentially a robot. So you put it in your home, plug it in, you connect it to the internet. Now, what this thing does is it's supposed to be like an assistant. Like if you've ever seen Star Trek, you know how like you know the commanders will talk to the computer the computer yeah. Will, yeah right it's like that except except way creepier so basically uh you can do a lot of things with this device i actually own one and it does help me in some respects like when i was getting dressed to come out here i said hey alexa what's the weather like and she helped me figure out that i need to wear a coat and a scarf right um but what this thing does is you basically can summon it you can say alexa and then you can ask it something. Alexa, what's the weather like today? Alexa, what do I have scheduled this week? Alexa, what's the capital of Belgium? Alexa, um, how much is a cactus on Amazon? She could order you a cactus if you want. So that's kind of helpful. And she can be helpful. Oh, Alexa, play this song. And she can you can hook her up to uh, some kind of song <laughs> streaming service, and then she can play music for you. Like Alexa, play. Nocturne and E minor, and she will play. And she actually is very good. I say she as though she's like a second yeah. thing. It, it, sorry, it uh, is very good at playing music. That shows very nice quality. Now, that's all good, right? Like I can just ask it to do whatever I want, right? But here's the thing it's always listen. It's, it's always listen. It's always listening. So, in order for it to be able to tell I'm saying Alexa, it has to have been listening for me. It has to have been waiting. Like, hey, all right, he's gonna say Alexa. Then I say it and she picks it up. But that means at all times, she is conceivably recording my environment. Uh, she's actually built it. God, she's not a ship. Um, it is built to be, to pick up audio from many different sources around the room. So if we place one, I placed one here and someone in the back of the classroom asked Alexa, they would pick you up because it has microphones. This model, this is one, this is an older model. It has microphones flanking um, each of its sides, right? Older or newer models have more than just four microphones. They might have eight. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or six. But basically it allows it to listen in a 360 degree field. So it can hear all around. It's really good at picking up people from across the room, which is again, it's nice if you're like in your kitchen and, and it's on the other side of the room and you want to figure out recipe directions, right? You can say, hey, how do I cook chicken soup or whatever? And it'll tell you. So that also means it's listening at all times. Now, Amazon says the reason this information is collected, the reason they're listening and recording what you're saying is to make it smarter. Because in order for it to understand what you're saying, 
it needs to figure out human speech. Not just that, but it needs to figure out what you sound like. So if I have one, I'm gonna say Alexa in a very specific way. When I say the word Alexa, it'll sound different than if Vivian said Alexa or if Diane said Alexa, it'll sound different, right? So it needs to figure out what I sound like and Amazon as a company needs to figure out, they need to give this robot as much data as possible to help it understand human speech. That's kind of how machine learning works. That's how like fancy robots like these work. They're very smart and can pick up what we're saying, but in order for them to do that, they need a lot of examples. If you want, for example, a robot that's very good at understanding human speech, you have to expose it to millions or even billions of sound clips of people talking. And that way you can learn patterns. Um, yeah, so they say they collect this data to make the device smarter and to help you and to help you, um, you know, with your tasks. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is just kind of a what do you think situation. I will say, despite all of the data that they collect, um, I mean, you can think of how many millions or even billions of audio recordings they collect every single day, right, from everybody who owns one of these. Despite all that data, it still screws up a lot of the time. If I say the name of a song, oftentimes it will butcher what I'm saying. So like, I'll ask, I don't know, play Chopin, and it'll be like, all right, I'm playing uh, like 50 Cent or like, I don't know, like just someone random. Yeah. But you have to say the name of the song. Yeah. At the time, you cannot tell uh, it, play my favorite song. Well, it, so if you hook it up to a certain service like Spotify, for example, if you've ever heard of it, you can also name a playlist. So if you've created a list of songs, you can name the list. You can say, hey, play my favorite songs, and it will play all your songs. It's actually pretty smart. But as you said, it's intrusive. Next, we have Google. Yeah, yeah. I've heard people say that they can, uh, different people can come into this thing and record or answer things and they could hear uh, if she asks something someone else will answer it hmm. so that there was some way sort of leaked hmm. well that's the other thing i haven't heard about that in particular but um and i have a friend who said she had when suddenly someone else answered that's weird i've never heard that before so it's I creepy <laughs> Yeah, that's what she said. Yeah, I mean, like, these things are also not, like, you know, they're not entirely watertight. So if someone really wanted to, they could, like, tap. To it. Yeah. Here's the thing. You know, I'm just a student, like, at some random school, right? So, like, I don't think anyone's particularly interested in, I don't think anyone's particularly interested in, like, you know, you know, tapping my Alexa. But you're not going to see one of these in the Oval Office. <laughs> you will not see an Alexa in like the Oval Office or in anywhere really important because it's too much of a security compromise. Because if someone was interested, they could tap it. These are not completely waterproof solutions. Another example is Google. And I don't mean the company, I mean the search. So when I search for something on Google, it's, uh, it's actually pretty smart. So it uses the same concept of machine learning uh, as Alexa. It doesn't use it in the same way, so it's not using machine learning to understand human speech, but it is using machine learning to understand human writing. So if I look up something like red dog, I don't know why, maybe I'm looking for Clifford the big red dog or something, right? So there, it will give me a whole bunch of results that are relevant. It will give me a bunch of pictures of red dogs. Anyway. But it does a very good job of understanding what it is I'm looking for and how to display the most relevant results first. Over time, too, it'll get smart and figure out, hey, he always tends to look up so-and-so around 4 p.m. Like, for example, I always tend to look up stuff related to Google Drive. Or I, I tend to look up stuff related to machine learning on Saturdays because I teach a class on Saturdays about machine learning. So around that time on Saturday, I always tend to look something up. So if I go to Google around that time and look something up, 
it will have that in mind and it will show the websites I always access. So convenient, yes, because it helps you find your stuff faster. But again, it's recording everything you do. In order to help figure out what re results to show first, it has to record that you always tend to look this up around this time. Again, data collection, and you have your own analysis of that, but some might consider that to be morally duties. Uh, then this is, I'm gonna go ahead and just read this for you. Um, and this is a statement from Facebook. Um, now this is from Facebook, now it's called Meta. But a few months ago, uh, Meta released this statement against Apple. And I will explain why in a second. Uh, we're standing up to Apple for small businesses everywhere. So Facebook is standing up to Apple, weird. So let's see what this means. At Facebook, small business is at the core of our business, which is a repetitive sentence, but whatever. Um, more than 10 million businesses use our advertising tools each month to find new customers, hire employees, and engage in their communities. Many in the small business community have shared concerns about Apple's forced software update, which will limit businesses' abilities to run personalized ads and reach their customers effectively. 44% of small to medium businesses started or increased their usage of personalized ads on social media during the pandemic, according to a new Deloitte study. Without personalized ads, Facebook data shows that the average small business advertiser stands to see a cut of over 60% in their sales for every dollar they spend. While limiting how personal ads can be used does impact larger communities like us, these changes will be devastating to small businesses, adding to many challenges they face right now. Small businesses deserve to be heard. We hear your concerns and we stand with you. Now, without me actually explaining anything, this seems like a pretty heroic endeavor, right? So Facebook is standing up for small businesses. But let me explain what actually happened. So Apple recently updated their phones where every single time an app wanted to track your location, so every single time an app wanted to figure out where on earth you were and record that information, it had to ask the user explicitly. That used to not be a rule. They used to be able to just get your location and not say anything. But Apple have it now ingrained in the software of the device. If your app wants to record the user's data, you have to ask them first. So, the thing is, you see what I'm saying? So the thing is, is that- Like when the uh, cookies come up, it says- Yeah, it has to ask you. So it's required by law, not by law, but it's required by policy to ask you, right? So there, uh, that screws over Facebook because Facebook is, I mean, it's a social media network, but it's also an advertising platform. So you're able to advertise to a very specific audience as a business. So you're able to say, I want to advertise to people who own two dogs and have three daughters. Like you can do that with Facebook. But the only reason you can do that is because they are recording so much information at all times. So when Apple blocks your ability to do that, um, then it kind of made it tougher for Facebook to target these people so effectively. But at the same time, it meant that Apple or it meant that Facebook couldn't collect as much information without users knowing. So it's actually a battle over privacy here. Um, Facebook was collecting a lot of data under the table that people weren't really aware of. And so when Apple tried to put a stop to that, uh, I mean, I think like the day Apple did this or the day that Apple announced they were gonna do this, Facebook's market share dropped like 23%. So this was a big deal for Facebook, but you have to ask yourself why because they were collecting a lot of information in secret. So, and then finally, uh, how many of you guys have heard about Cambridge Analytica? Right, so back in 2016, the election between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, um, you can see the results on the top right hand corner here. So Cambridge Analytica was this firm located in the UK, um, and they were basically a, they, they were like a data collection firm and they would sell their services to political campaigns. Now, the thing is, um, when I say that they would, they would collect data, it makes it sound as though maybe they went to a bunch of people and polled them or something like that, but no, no. 
what they would do is if you were a user on Facebook and you played a game on Facebook, so you played like, I don't know, Farmville or something like that, they would collect your demographic information without you knowing. Then come 2016, uh, they were really, really important to the Trump campaign. And before then they were important to the Ted Cruz campaign. So they gave a lot of information to both of these campaigns. Um, and when it came down to it, uh, when it came down to just Trump and Hillary, the thing that really gave Trump the edge was his ability to advertise extremely effectively. He could advertise using Facebook's full force. He could advertise to whoever he wanted. And it made him a much more, um, it arguably won him the election. The thing is, he, he got this information because this organization, Cambridge Analytica, was colluding with Facebook to secretly record your information. So Facebook got, was under a lot of pressure because of this. And then Cambridge Analytica ended up dissolving because of this. This was a huge scandal. But here, Trump was effectively able to, one of the reasons he was able to win the election, you could argue, is because of this shady under the rug uh, information collection. So here we can see, I'll give you four examples here. So here we can see that the way data is recorded is sometimes kind of shady, right? Like we have Apple, Facebook, Google, you know, Amazon, whatever. Um, and they tend to record things under the hood without you even knowing. And this can have real life consequences like in 2016. So um, the next thing I want to talk about is machine learning. So when I say machine learning, um, again, I'm referring to uh, some kind of software that can learn on its own. So what that means is software that like changes its rules in order to be adaptive. So something that can like learn human speech or analyze images, something like that, right? Face. Yeah, face recognition, exactly. So machine learning is effectively um, artificial, intelligence. artificial intelligence. Yeah. So it's something that can learn on the fly and is super adaptive to different situations. So that's machine learning. And machine learning has really, it's like machine learning is like an offshoot of computer science and it has its own ethical dilemmas as well. So first of all, self-driving trucks. So you guys might've heard about self-driving cars, right? The idea of a self-driving truck might be like funny because it's like a big, it's like a really big robot and kind of scary. But turns out um, this is like a photoshopped image. This isn't a real device, I don't think. But it turns out that uh, devices like these, this self-driving truck, for example, uh, this is something that could be out in the next. Well, actually, some of them exist already. Um, so do you, do you have a question or? I have a comment. Oh, I worked at Wild Cornell. Yeah. They have this to clean the floors. They have like a self. It goes into the elevator and it's, it's very frightening to anyone because <laughs> it just goes around and it uh, cleans the floors and you don't know what, nobody seems to know what it is because <laughs> it's alone. <laughs> it's noxious. It goes to the elevator. I don't know if anyone has seen it at the hospital. I had that for a while. I didn't see it, so I don't know what happened. I don't know if it ran into somebody, <laughs> but they were using it, and yeah. it was, uh, you know, uh, it was very to me. It was, it was like I'm not a patient. I was frightened by it because I didn't know where it was going to go next. Yeah, sure. I mean, there. So that robot was able to probably not run into anybody because it was programmed to monitor in front of itself. In like an angle and if there was an obstacle in the way it would just not move into the obstacle so this is similar i mean it's much higher stakes right because it's a big truck and if it screws up it's like a big cannonball but um it's a self-driving truck and this means that you don't need a trucker driving it you can have it go from new york to la carrying a load of cargo and not pay a single trucker a dime okay now the thing is um if this seems like far-fetched technology, it's not. So when I say New York to LA, that has actually happened. There is a truck and it was equipped with self-driving technology. So this truck was able to 
like autopilot. It was able to drive itself. And um, the, I mean, now in this experiment, there were truckers at the wheel. So if the, <clears throat> if the truck was screwing up somehow, a human agent would then grab the wheel and move the truck on their own, but they never needed to. This thing was able to drive from New York all the way to Los Angeles without a, a person ever having to interfere. So this technology is not like 20 years in the future. This is really the only thing keeping it off the roads now is like policy, right? What does it run on? What do you mean? Gas. Yeah, it runs on gas. Gas. Yeah, runs on gas. So the only thing, the only thing about this that's like artificially intelligent is you can think of the robotic driver. Otherwise, it's the same as a normal truck. It's just that there's a computer here, and a computer, kind of like your spooky vacuum cleaner, is like, oh, there's a car up ahead. I need to get in a different lane here. I need to get off at this exit. I must accelerate. And this will always conform to traffic laws. Yes. So this human, I mean, human driver is like, I'm not going to say I speed sometimes, but maybe I do occasionally. So I mean, hey, if, if, the, if, the, if the speed limit's like 65, maybe you'll go like 70. And it's not like most cops will care. Some do, totally. But whatever. Um, this, if the speed limit's 55, it will go 55. If there is a lane where it cannot move, it cannot go to, it will not go there. This will, it's the absolute most square, picture perfect driver you can imagine without a human involved. Now, can somebody tell me why this might be uh, a problem? Or who do you think this would impact negatively? The truckers. Why would it impact the, the truckers negative? How do you put people out of work? Exactly. They'd be out of work. I mean, it's, it's the unions. Unions, yeah. So, I mean, this is the same thing as what you're hearing in factories, right? In factories, you have robotic arms that are able to just do the same thing humans do, but you don't have to pay the robots. If we're looking at this from a CEO's perspective, this is great. Yeah, I can just buy have, They have to build it. So, that means building different. The, the building construction gets affected. The cars, the people who make cars go to trucks. Yeah, it has ripples, right? So from a CEO's perspective, this is great. I could just buy a fleet of these and then never spend a dime on them again. I mean, I have to pay for gas, but these things fill themselves up at a gas station. Um, but I don't have to pay for truckers. So that's a huge cost that I'm saving. But for the truckers themselves, I mean, there are truckers who are like 55, right? And this is what they've been doing their entire lives. So if these things become the new norm, where the hell do they go? Like everything. Exactly. It's kind of like coal miners. It's like a like, you know, for like if you look at like why coal is still a big thing, like why are we still burning coal? One argument that's admittedly kind of hard to ignore is if we were to switch over to entirely renewable energy, that would put a lot of like West Virginia out of work. Anybody that deals in coal will suddenly be out of work. And that's all they've been doing their entire life. So what are they going to do now? Same thing with truckers. You know, This is going to lead to less accidents because these are better drivers than humans. And the truckers arguably could be healthier because sitting at a wheel for 18 hours at a time is probably not good, that good for you. But then what are they going to do with themselves? So uh, another example is machine learning that reads resumes. So I spoke about this last time, actually, how um, you can have a machine learning agent read a resume and diagnose whether or not it's good, right? So again, from a CEO's perspective, this is a good thing because it means we can get through applicants way faster, right? So we can get in a whole bunch of applicants for a job, and then we'll have a robot just judge whether or not these people are good enough to let it. But the bad thing about this is sometimes these models screw up and not just in a small way. But for example, um, Amazon, and I told this story last time, I'm gonna tell it again. So Amazon tried doing something like this back in like 2015 or 2016. They tried creating a robot that would uh, read resumes for them. Here's the problem. Uh, Amazon, if you think about your typical Amazon employee, it's a white guy. That's, that's your typical Amazon employee. So what did the robot learn is the best applicant for Amazon? Really the best applicant for Amazon is somebody who's really good at software engineering. It's somebody who can write good code, right? And deliver and is a good teammate and 
has like proven that they are a good team. Like that's the best applicant. But with the way these robots operate, um, that's not really what they always learn. They don't just learn that the best applicant's really good at software, but it could also be that the best applicant's clearly got to be a white guy because that's what that's who Amazon has let in the most so far. So clearly, that's who Amazon wants. So there was a big controversy because if you submitted your resume and they claim they never actually deployed this in the field, but we're not really sure about that. Um, if you submitted, if you were for example, the captain of the women's basketball team at Harvard, okay? Amazon's robot in 2016 would look at your resume, they would see the words women's basketball team, and that would decrease the value of your resume. If it had the word woman on your resume, it would decrease its value instead of increase. If you said that you were a woman, if you said that you were a person of color, and if you said you were disabled, you would deduct points from your resume. Now, obviously, I mean, I would hope that nobody at Amazon actually tried to code that. That's just how it learned. But this is still an issue, right? So if we let robots run everything, they're gonna make mistakes. And this is one such pretty egregious mistake. Finally, we have self-driving cars. So I talked about self-driving trucks. Um, but self-driving cars are maybe a bigger deal because self-driving trucks would mostly affect truckers and like logistics and stuff like that. Self-driving cars could affect everybody, right? So think about it. You wanna drive from here to Chicago, right? That's an arduous trip because you not only have to drive your car from here to Chicago, but you also have to be playing, you have to pay close attention the whole time. You're driving a car. It's a kind of high stakes environment, right? So what if instead we could just turn on our car, tell it where we wanna go and it'll drive us there for us, right? That sounds great, right? So there, it's not like anyone's getting out of employment. It's not like it's kicking anyone out of their job. But instead what this is doing is computers screw up sometimes, right? So <clears throat> right now companies like Tesla you know, are researching um, self-driving cars. It's like Elon Musk's Tesla and also Mitsubishi, other companies are trying to figure out how to make a good self-driving car. The problem is uh, even if self-driving cars learn to be better drivers than us, which is very possible because we screw up a lot. We have a lot of motor accidents every year. Even if self-driving cars learn to be better drivers than we are, there's a really complicated issue of ethics, which is what happens if it screws up? And if it screws up, who do you blame? Right, so here's the thing. Let's say there's an accident, okay? Um, let's say you're driving your car uh, in, like a, in like a neighborhood or like a near a shopping mall or whatever, and your brakes fail. And there's somebody in front of the car. There, unfortunately, that person will get injured. Right? But there, it's pretty clear who to blame. You're not to blame because it's not like you ripped the brakes out of your car at the last second. You didn't do it on purpose. The pedestrian isn't to blame because they're just doing normal pedestrian things. The person to blame then is the car company or the entity because they made brakes that fail. That's, it's their fault, clearly, right? Okay, what if it's a self-driving car, same scenario, except instead of the brakes failing, it's the software. The software doesn't recognize there's a person in front of the car and just keeps going. So what if that happens? Are they insured? I don't know. That's a great question. Insurance is going to get weird with this, right? So think about it. Is it the car's fault? Is it the car company's fault? Is it the fault of whoever wrote the software? Is it your fault for not intervening? The idea of fault becomes kind of convoluted. And then insurance becomes complicated. So I mean, that's Are you using this? not yet. This isn't a thing yet, but it could be pretty soon. So this actually brings us to the trolley problem. Has anybody ever heard of the trolley problem before? So the trolley problem. Let me explain what this is. So the trolley problem is actually it's a funny thing, <clears throat> and it's not just in computer science; it's in a lot of other fields as well. So this is the trolley problem. It's a scenario, okay? So there's a trolley, right? 
The trolley is on its way to run over five feet. Okay, so it's going to continue straight. If nobody does anything, it will continue straight and run over five feet. However, you are at a lever, and you have the ability to pull the lever, which will then redirect the trolley and it will only run over one person. Okay, so what do you do? I want to hear what do you, what do you do with this scenario? Do you pull the lever? I try to run push the lever through the water. Then. <laughs> you, try, you try to like kick them off the track and then pull the lever. Let's pretend we don't have enough time. I like you're thinking outside the box. All right, but I don't see anybody jumping to give me an answer. Oh. No. Why, why, why are you guys hesitant to give me an answer? Because it's, it's not ethical. Why isn't it ethical? Because you're killing people. people. You're killing people. Deliberately. Yeah. Okay, so so tell me, how is it that you're killing people? Like, uh, what do you think of the same color? What's that? Are they all the same color? I mean, I don't know. They're, they're, they're just, I mean, there's... Does it make a difference? No, I mean, I guess if you're, it depends who you're asking, unfortunately, it might, but like, these, the, who knows? There's just five people. They don't know their demographics. Five people, one person. If it seems straight, if you don't do anything, it'll kill five people. If you pull the lever, you will kill one person. Well, Putin would do five. Putin, would he? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, so what do you guys think? So what is it that makes this problem complicated? Who is the person to pull the lever? Yeah. yeah. Who is the guy in charge? I mean, it's you. Okay. In, in the same area. Really, if this might happen, that there's, there should be a possibility to jump the trunk, to stop the trunk. No, no. The, the problem is just what it's I decision. Yeah, it's no, the it's decision. A, since it can happen, it can happen something be developed to to, to be able to, 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 to stop the drum. It doesn't matter. All that's important is the scenario. I mean, in real life, yeah, maybe we try to jam the track here, or maybe we like, I don't know, we, we pick them off. The, but in this scenario, we want to focus just on like the philosophical mm -hmm. part of it, right? So the problem that makes this so hard is that if we do nothing, five people die, which is objectively worse than if one person dies. The problem is, if we do pull a lever, we are directly responsible for that one person's death, right? So, and then this can get even more complicated. What if this is a scenario where this is like a loved one, or like this is like a family member, or these are family members? Then this gets a lot more complicated. Like, imagine the scenario I just described, it's like these are all your like siblings or something. You're probably going to be a lot more inclined to pull the lever, right? So, how does this translate into this? Well, let's imagine we are designing a self-driving car. Let's say the brakes fail, okay? So let's say we're driving down a one-way road, okay? This is a one-way road with two lanes in it. We're on the left lane and our brakes fail. So we, as the designers of the robot piloting the car, we can do one of two things. We can let the car continue forward and run over five people, or we can design the car to swerve right and only hit one person. But then we are responsible for that person's death, right? So we could write the software to tell the car, try to hit less people, or we do nothing and then continue forward. What about uh, swerve to the, to the other side where there's no, no, no one could be? Well, that's the that's the most ideal situation. But in a scenario where that's not possible, what do you do? Here's another example. Let's say we're driving down the road, and uh, again, we're we're thinking of this from the perspective of the people who wrote the software, right? So we're not the driver, we're not the car manufacturer, we're behind the robot, right? So let's think of this another scenario. We're driving down the road with one lane, okay, just a one-way road. There's five people in front of us and a brick wall on either side. The brakes fail. There's one person in the car. Do we code the car to swerve into a brick wall and kill the driver? Or do we program the car to just continue forward and kill five people? So in other words, do we favor our one driver or do we favor five random sessions? So it's a kind of wacky scenario. Um, and this could very well happen. Uh, and like a self, if self-driving cars were a thing, 
then there would be scenarios like this where the person who wrote the software is essentially making the best decision. They're kind of playing God, right? Now, this is actually kind of interesting. Mitsubishi is one of the companies that's working on self-driving cars. And they were asked in a scenario where you can either purposefully design the car to kill its driver to save five people. Are you going to save the driver or will you save five people? Mitsubishi was asked this. <laughs> well, no, it's, it's more like, as Mitsubishi, so we are Mitsubishi, somebody asks us in this scenario, something where like something in the car fails, are you gonna kill your driver, your one driver, or will you kill five pedestrians? Do you know what Mitsubishi said? Can anyone guess? Yeah. Mitsubishi would run over five people, not kill the driver. Does anybody know why? Because, think about it. It's cheaper. It's, well, it might be cheap. I don't know if it's cheaper. Because you do, you would have to pay for like expenses for five people rather than one. But the thing is, nobody wants to buy your car if they know it's designed to just kill you if something comes up. If a scenario like this happens, nobody wants to buy the car that will just kill you in a scenario like that. So they always favor the driver. They favor the person behind the wheel. Even if it's like one person behind the wheel and one person in front of the car, they will favor the driver because they need to protect their customers or something like that. So it's kind of a wacky <clears throat> uh, scenario. And there's also, um, this is like a bonus slide. There's a bunch of like funny, like spinoffs of the trolley problem. So you have one that's just like absurd and completely impossible to follow. You have like another where nobody's in any danger. You're a professor of moral philosophy. Do you tie people to the rails to save your job? Um, yeah, no, they're kind of fun. So um, we have about 15 minutes left actually. Uh, so let's go ahead. Hey, you know, we did our lecture last week on uh, fishing, right? Oh, wait. Because I just got an email that said reset password, and I didn't actually request to reset my password. If you ever get an email like that, it probably means someone's trying to scam you. Just be careful. Anyways, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, so we're actually going to go ahead. We're going to go play a little game. So follow along with me. So this is a game from the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology from MIT. And this is called The Moral Machine. So you'll see what this is. <clears throat> so this is actually a study by MIT to see how people would respond in different scenarios. So we're gonna complete this as a class. So here's how this works, okay? So we can, oh, sorry, I screwed that up. Okay, so here's how this works. So let's show the description of either scenario. So um, it's gonna give us 13 different scenarios and we have to decide what the car should do, okay? So this is a self-driving car. Um, we designed the software, the robot pilot, right? So on the left, um, <clears throat> in this case, the self-driving car with sudden brake failure will continue ahead and drive through a pedestrian crossing ahead. This will result in one dead elderly. Uh, note that this man is flouting the law by crossing on a red signal. So this guy, this old senior citizen is jaywalking, okay? On the right, the self-driving car with sudden brake failure will purposefully swerve and drive through a pedestrian crossing to the other lane. This will result in another dead elderly man, but the difference is that he is past, he is crossing the road on a green signal when he's supposed to. So what should our car do? What do you think? On the left, the car does nothing. So we take our hands off the scenario and we're not responsible for anything that's happened. Um, and we run over one elderly man, he's jaywalking. On the right, the car will purposefully swerve out of the way to save this guy's life. And we will kill somebody following the traffic signal. So what do you think we should do? Playing God. Yeah, we are playing God. It's, it's a difficult scenario.
Does anybody have any ideas? There is a big thing like saying uh, that the one on this side was you can't mention the danger. Yeah. See, now you're thinking, you're thinking within the bounds that we need to think. So here's the thing. It's a hard decision to make, right? We need to do either one of these. But you, if we had to argue for one over the other, we could say, well, and whenever anybody jaywalks, I mean, I jaywalk all the time, like that's just the thing people do in NYC. But um, when you jaywalk, you're accepting a risk because you're crossing a street. So it's your fault. I guess. Yeah. There's no cars there you, most of the time, but yeah. So I guess we'll, we'll go with the one on the left. Okay. Uh, <laughs> It gets, it gets worse. Um, okay, so on the left, we have, uh, let's see, one woman, one large woman, and then two female athletes. And on the right, we have one man, one large man, and two male athletes. Um, so in one scenario, the car continues forward and the women die. And on the, and on the right, the car will swerve into a blockage and some men will die. Uh, again, this is a really tricky scenario. <laughs> Um, so I don't know. I mean, what do you think? <laughs> it's not easy. I have, I have a perspective I could share with you, um, but I'm curious to see if anybody else has something. If you're a driver, right, and you're behind that wheel and but it fails, what if you do absolutely nothing? If, that's an excellent question. If you do absolutely nothing. Because you don't want to do either. You don't want to do either. Right. What happens then? Well, think about it. If you're behind the wheel of this car and right. you do absolutely nothing, the car is the car is, has failed. It's not you. It's the car. Right. It stops. Is that what you say? Or it keeps going? It'll keep going. But that's the car's fault. It's the fault of, we see, see, it says sudden brake failure. That's actually the fault of the manufacturer of the car, right? So if you do nothing in this scenario, you're kind of washing yourself away from sin because I mean, yes, four people will die, but that's not because of you. If you are the driver and you purposefully swerve into a block, you're going to die and you're taking three people with you. So, what, what is your idea? So, first of all, uh, you're uh, the, the first part of the crossing. Uh -huh. uh, after that, uh, it's up to you to, to make sure that no car is coming at all uh, on, the, on the side before you cross. I mean, this is to be right. And then there wouldn't be, it wouldn't be about what the center of the car should do. There should not, there not be this, this option. Yeah, right. So, okay. It will not make a lot of difference anyway. So, okay, that's a, that's a great, that's a great point. So, so basically, when we're designing these cars, we nev we make a law. You're never allowed to program your car to do this. Great. So that could be the law. We are never allowed to program the car to swim. OK. That could actually be a pretty good solution. Now, in this scenario, I'll go ahead and I'll step in and make a decision. I'm going to go with the left because it's essentially nobody's fault. I mean, it's the car company's fault. But if you do this as the driver or as the programmer, then you're responsible for these four dead. Whereas this is just the kind of, it's a tough scenario. Okay, let's see what's the difference here. So here on the left, we have one dead man. And on the right, we have one male athlete. <laughs> so would we rather save the normal guy or the athlete? The problem here is that um, if we swerve here and kill the normal guy, um, it's our fault. But if it just continues forward and kills the athlete, it's the car company's fault. How does distance and play a role in this? The distance, nobody seems to mention the distance between the failure. Mm -hmm. Here we can assume that the velocity of the car is high in the air. And there are 13 cases, are What's that? There are 13 cases. Yeah, I mean, we're not going to go through all of them. No, I mean, I'm not, 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 I
<laughs> There's a lot. No, and these aren't actually, um, these are random every time too. So every time someone takes this test, it will be different scenarios. Can we have, can we on this on the, on the, yeah, if you want, you, you just, just you, all you have to do, look up MIT moral machine. MIT moral machine. If you want to do this, then you can. And it'll actually, at the end, it will give you like a, a bunch of analytics. So you know what? What's the answer? You know what? I'm going to step in. I'll answer for you guys. Okay. We'll just do that. So now everybody can make judgments on me. Okay. So you guys are free. Of any moral judgment, now you can just look at me and point fingers. Okay, so what does Augustine do in this scenario? Well, I am going to choose this one because it's not our fault. Conceivably, it's taking away more years of human life because male athlete will probably live longer than man, but this is not my fault. I am free of any blame. It's not my fault. It's the fault of the guy who, who designed the brain. Okay. Uh, all right, so on the left, if the car continues forward and does absolutely nothing, then it will kill a woman, two female doctors, a girl, and a female executive. On the right, if it purposefully swerves, it will kill a man, two male doctors, a boy, and one male executive. So we can see here the body is exactly the same for both. We have exactly the same type of people, only one of them is female, the other is male. Again, I'm trying to avoid blame. These are the exact, see, I'm looking at this as exactly the same group of people. I'm not valuing men over women or women over men. These are, the, I'm trying my absolute hardest to remove sex as a characteristic. I'm not even considering it. So if these, if this is one group of ambiguously gendered people and one group of ambiguously gendered people, I'm going to favor the one where it's not my fault. So I'll go with this one. All right, here it's, an elderly man is killed or a man is killed. Gonna go with this one because I'm not trying to have it be my fault. Um, you can see I actually have, uh, a, I have a preference here, which is to avoid blame, right? Um, here we have uh, three dead men and one woman on the right. And then we have three male athletes and one female athlete here. So. Conceivably, again, we're taking away more human life if we favor this one or if we favor this one. But I guess this is because of my perspective as somebody in software engineering. I don't want to design something that kills people. So I, I don't want to design, because let's think of it this way. If it does do this, if, I, if it does do this, that means if I hear this on the news, if I hear, oh yeah, a car swerved and killed four people on a sidewalk, it's me, it's my fault. Because I programmed the car to do that. If I hear that on the news, I know it's my fault. If this happens, it's the fault of whoever designed the brakes. So I'll go with this. Here we have, let's see. A boy, an elderly woman, a female athlete, and a cat. <laughs> I don't know why the cat's there. Um, and then we have a boy, an elderly woman, and a female athlete. So conceivably, we're, they're exactly the same group of constituents only this one has a cat so we're killing more people or i guess beings if we go on the left um and on the right they are okay so this is a little more interesting so on the left everybody including the cat is following the law so good for the cat right on the right these people are jaywalking so i don't know because the problem is these people are breaking the law, right? These guys accepted a risk that they're jaywalking and that something bad could happen, right? These guys on the left are crossing when they're supposed to cross. So they expect nothing to happen and legally they're protected, right? So again, I still want to answer left because I'm thinking of this from the perspective of the software designer, but I'm gonna go with the right because these people are following the they're following the law. They have an expectation nothing is going to happen. Whereas on the right, they have ex, they have accepted a risk that if they do this, something could happen. It is like playing God, though. and if you find that this is somewhat disturbing because of the fact that you're playing God, it is. It's playing God. People in this scenario, people who design these systems, are kind of playing God, right? So we have two male doctors and a cat on the left. We have one large woman, a man, and a boy on the right. 
Uh, I would want to save the life of a child. So I would serve, I would do the left. I don't care about anyone else involved. Let's see, four dogs. <laughs> okay, all right, okay. So on the left, we have four dogs and a cat. <laughs> on the right, we have a female athlete, a boy, two women, and one male executive. Uh, who here has pets at home? I mean, I used to have a cat. I think they're lovely creatures. They're great. They're very cute parasites, right? I love them. They do nothing good for you other than be cute. But I'm going to run over them because, I mean, like as much as I love animals, as much as I love dogs and cats, I do not favor their lives over humans. And that's, I, I, that's, I just find that to be a fundamental part of my ethics. Again, okay, I don't know how you could conceivably answer this one because it's a pregnant woman versus a cat. Oh my God. <laughs> how would you answer that? How, who in their right mind would do that? I don't care. Okay. Not only that, but the, the cat is Jaywalk. The only difference here, I mean, I don't think the cat has a concept of that, but the only difference here is that if we do this, uh, no, okay, who, on, who in their right mind would ever do this one? Because not only are you running over a pregnant woman, you're also directly responsible for it. If she was here and you just continued forward, at least then it's the brake failure. It's not your fault. But here you're going out of your way to choose the wrong answer. I'm going to choose the cat. This is the stupidest one so far. Uh, here we have a homeless person versus a woman. All right, see, this is a, see, I don't like this one because this one makes me uncomfortable because it feels like a class. I feel like I'm going to be implicitly classist by just answering this. So let me be very clear. Um, I am not favoring the life of a woman over a homeless man because the man is homeless. That's not, again, within the same, when I, within my own answer, I'm trying to discount as much as possible whether or not you're a man or a woman, and also discount how rich you are or poor you are. So I'm not going to consider that at all. With that being said, though, one of these scenarios is somebody jaywalking and then it's sudden brake failure and I'm not responsible. The other is somebody who is following the law and I purposefully have the car swerve to hit them. So I'm going to go with this one because I am free of blame and because that person accepted a risk by jaywalking. So this is the second to last one. So we have one female executive and a large man. And on the right, we have one female executive, a large man, a dog and a homeless person and you're responsible. But these people are jaywalking. So do we favor the people who are jaywalking or do we favor, wait, do we favor, hmm, I don't know. I think I'm gonna go with this one because it's, it's less life lost and you're not responsible and they're jaywalking. And then finally we have three men and one woman, right? Versus four homeless people in a car. Um, Again, I'm going to go with this one because I'm effectively fully blame. So 13 scenarios. I've answered all of them. Uh, yes. What are, wait, hold on. Uh, it's supposed to give you, here, hold on. Uh, I'll just leave these where they are. Oh, here. Um, Okay, all right, interesting. So um, it doesn't know anything about me in these categories. It doesn't know how religious I am. It doesn't know my political beliefs or anything like that. But this is where it thought my values were. So social value preference. Um, you guys didn't actually get to see any, but in this scenario, there's, there's doctors and then there's robbers. So one of the things that can happen is there's like four robbers versus four doctors. Um, we didn't actually see any, any robbers, so this doesn't matter. How much do I care about upholding the law? I seem to care about it a little bit, or at least I tend to favor it. So implicitly, I believe that if you're jaywalking, you kind of accepted a risk. Uh, I don't prefer fit or large people. Uh, I tend to favor protecting passengers a little bit. I tend to save more lives whenever possible. So in scenarios where I can save more lives or just one life, I tend to save more lives. I care a lot about avoiding intervention. And I mean, that was pretty clear when I was explaining it out loud. Uh, obviously I prefer humans. I, I don't like, I mean, I've, so I teach again, I teach on Saturdays, I teach high schoolers about machine learning. 
and um, the second to last class I have with them, if we have time at the end, I'll do this exercise with them and I'll have them do it on their own. Um, and I've seen like some kids where <laughs> the slider was all the way to the right. I'm like, what? I've seen some kids who like prefer pets over people, but you know, whatever. Uh, I prefer humans. Apparently I prefer men, uh, saving men over saving women. I, I mean, I don't think I do, but apparently in these scenarios I do. And age preference, um, I would actually put it over here because like, I'm not discounting older people, but if I could save the life of a child or an infant, that would, that would actually place itself above adults. Um, yeah. How willing are you to buy a self-driving car? No, actually I'm interested. After, what do you guys think? Would you buy a self-driving car? No? no well, I guess there's some bias here because I did just explain to you like the moral ambiguity of it, but it is pretty convenient. I mean, you don't have to pay attention at the wheel, but I'd still feel anxiety from using one because I think in the back of my mind, I'd always be wondering what if it screws up? What if it screws up, right? I don't know. So like, if the, the brakes fail and you see the wheel? Yeah, I'm pretty sure in a self-driving car, it's not like they would just remove the wheel. I think it would be more like autopilot. So you could turn on the self-driving car to pilot itself. But if you ever push the brakes or grab the wheel, you just immediately assume control. Kind of like cruise control, you know, in a car. If you're on the highway, you can turn on cruise control, which will just, you can take your foot off the pedal and it'll, ma it'll maintain your speed, right? So 75 miles per hour or something. But as soon as you touch the um, brake, it turns off cruise control and you're in control. So I think that's how it would be. I think that's how it would work. I hope that's how it would work. I personally, I don't think I would buy a self-driving car, probably because they'd be more expensive and because then the risk is a little too high. I would always feel like, I, I know who I am. I think I would be, I'd feel anxious the whole time. I'm like, what if this screws up? You know, I wouldn't want that to happen. At least if something happens while I'm piloting the car, it's my fault. But I have a lot more control over the situation conceivably. Yeah. Doing this, would this help the programs to rede redesign the thing so it should not fail? See, um, that you know, when, when they compile this and they see all of this data, mm -hmm. don't you think they should say, well, maybe this design has flaws? Yeah, that's that's exactly why this study exists. Okay, so you see, that's the, okay. Yeah, so this, this study is like, it's, I mean, in a, a very morbid black comedy way. This is, I would yeah, argue kind of, a, it. it's like a, it's a kind of funny, I, I think it's a kind of funny exercise, but this is from MIT to collect data. How do people actually believe, or what do people tend to, to favor in these scenarios? So this is actually extremely valuable data that I'm providing. Um, yeah, and well, it's- On the end, when it says, you know, most people would buy it or not buy it. That would be the ultimate, you would think. Yeah, I mean. Motivation for them to do something more, perhaps? Well. Design-wise. Yeah, the thing is, in terms of machine learning, um, if you look at trends, what, it's, okay, at least within like our techno capitalist market, it's not necessarily if we should use a machine learning thing, but it's when. People don't that, like big companies don't ask why or if we should use a certain technology. It's more like, okay, when are we going to do this? Self driving cars, if you think about this like, as like game theory almost, self driving cars, somebody is going to design this. If it's not Tesla, it'll be Mitsubishi, right? So I don't know. I guess I am a little bit, I guess I see it that way where it's like, it's not really when, or it's not only like if, but it's a when, you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. It was your question. If there cannot be the dispensable scenario with giving more uh, information about the people, for instance, the one person against the four. Uh -huh. What if the one on the left is someone who is a very good human being and who save lives, and and the other ones are the people with a mental deterioration or or. But you don't know that. Yeah, first of all. If you knew. Well, here's the thing. First of all. You don't know. And you don't know. But that isn't 
Yeah, so here's the thing, here's the thing, here's the thing. First of all, and realistically, it's not like the car could scan and then identify these people and then run like a background check and then do like a scoring system. And even if it could, like even if the car was able to run, even if the car was able to like score you on how much you contribute to society or whatever, that really, personally to me, that is playing wrong because that's like, well, who are you to judge? I mean, even it's like, because like, because because morality, I mean, it's crazy because, you know, you know, like, it's like, it's like one person, the person behind the wheel is like, I don't know, it's like a saint, whatever. And then the person in front are like, these are like four murderers or whatever. But like, again, that's still playing God because to, to value or devalue people based on their history or, or conditions or anything, it's, it's that I think is very much playing God. So arguably the best thing to do there would be not consider none of that at all. You just don't consider you their, don't buy. yeah, you like ignore it. It's, or yeah, you don't buy it. The best scenario here is to just not buy it. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. they don't see the fact that uh, this is in the, in the talk for them, the talk for two, that swimming uh, into the next lane. And what about people who are coming on top of that lane? Then, okay. then they're screwed. That's a, uh, an open factor for more death. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. So the, now you found yourself back at the original trolley problem because the trolley problem, again, <laughs> do we lift up our hands and ignore the problem and let it continue as it does and it kills five people or do we step in and intervene, but then it only, the but it kills one person, but we're responsible for that person's it's, death. It's the consequence. Yeah. No matter what. No matter what. It's a lose lose. Yeah. It's a lose lose because either it's five person or five people are dead, but you have no responsibility, or it's one person is dead, but you're responsible for that person. So that's the trolley problem. This is just a law of like, I don't know, it's like a law of physics almost. It's just a fundamental lose lose. <laughs> I just hope the people designing this really do a good job. Yeah. On the brakes. See, this is the thing. If this were, if from the very beginning cars were self driving, like everybody, like every car, just like, I don't know, Henry Ford or whatever designed the Model T and the Model T was a self-driving car. And we built all of our infrastructure around self-driving cars. Every car on the road is a self-driving car and can communicate with other self-driving cars and coordinate themselves. And all of the streets are catered towards that. If all of society was set up to deal with self-driving cars, that would be, your, that would be perfect. Because think about it, if every car on the road is a self-driving car, these cars can coordinate like, hey, I need to get out. I need to exit at this exit. So then other self-driving cars will move themselves out of the way and let that car, at that point, it's almost like a train, you know? But if you have a mixture of self-driving cars and human drivers, things become complicated. Or if you have a, a mixture of self-driving cars and people on the streets who aren't familiar with it. So what is the idea of the event wanting to, wanting to build self because because I have sat here and I've explained to you the moral complexity of it and I've made it sound kind of scary but at the end of the day it's engineering it's engineering and at the end of the day think about it if you're driving from here to Los Angeles it's a hell of a trip it is think about it if, if the car drove itself you wouldn't even need to pay for a hotel and you could just sit behind the wheel fall asleep the car would stop itself for gas, and you just like wake up and you're in Los Angeles. No. Okay, I mean, that's your answer. But the thing is, this is a country of 300 something million people. A non negligible amount of people will, would be interested in tech like this, are interested in tech like this. So, you know what my, you know what my solution to this is? Better trains. Jesus, if we just have better trains, you could go from city A to city B. That's my personal opinion. If you take very good care of your brakes, do, do that uh, break, I mean, do that uh, break uh, anyway? Or? Well, yeah, I mean, the, uh, hypothetically, you want to keep your car in as good shape as possible, but there's always room for failure. That's the thing. The best thing I think is if we had better infrastructure for transportation. Okay, it's not the fault of the driver anyway. Although they are not driving, if they don't take good care of their car, mm -hmm. and, they, and then it's the car company's fault. Yeah. If, 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 the car company's fault. if the brakes fail, 
and this car doesn't swerve itself on purpose. Yeah. Well, or if the brakes fail, the car should stop. Yes. Can we not fix that? I mean, there's ideally, ideally, yeah. But you have to realize in a country built around cars and with like millions of interactions on the road per day, there's always room for failure. Yeah, right. And then like something will screw up. It's like watches will tell you that they're water resistant, not waterproof. You know what I mean? Like there's always room for failure. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm not too old to even consider this, but thank you for bringing it up. Hey, I mean, I think it's a, it's a bit of a somber discussion because we have to deal with like ideas of death and like who would you save in a scenario, right? But I at least wanted to tickle your brains in this regard because like computer science, let me reiterate what I said at the beginning of this. Computer science is a three-pronged field. You have software, math, and ethics. And people often don't think enough about ethics. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. No, they don't. Yeah. So, like, you know, 